One day, while I was attending a youth camp in Dominican Republic, the guest speaker for the retreat asked a thought-provoking question that troubled me and awakened my mind. With a deep thought of personal reflection, are you free? From that moment, I have been asking myself a question. Am I truly free? You must be asking yourself at this moment, what do you mean? Free from your parents? Free from restrictions? The answer to that question, well, I'm trying to figure out myself. But I will share with you what God has impressed me with so far. The world defines freedom as power or right to act, speak, or think as one wants, without hindrance or restraints. Examples, I feel free to break these rules today. Nobody has to tell me what to do. Or freedom, no more school, no staff, no more work. I'm going to do whatever I want. Galatians 5.1 defines freedom as follows. Stand fast, therefore, in liberty, wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled with the yoke of bondage. Although it is funny, those of us who are fellow canvassers, when we present the book, The Steps to Christ, we say, this book helps you find freedom from worry, guilt, and fear. But are you really free? Tonight, I will be sharing the differences between freedom in the world and freedom in Christ. Finally, I will be talking about Christ uh, as our example of true freedom. Before we look into the word of God, please bow your head with me for prayer. Dear God, thank you for today, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity of being here. And help us all learn what you have in store for us tonight, Lord, and that we may um, put it into practice and that it may be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I would like to begin talking about freedom in the world. First John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The world offers many pleasures in which many youth fail to resist. Parties, ungodly entertainment, corruption such as drugs, and drinking is what we actually call freedom. Why? We feel free from our problems, pain, trials, and so on. Some drink or consume drugs because they can forget, for the moment, what they're going through. The bad memories are too much to bear. We become desperate and start looking for other options. I've always wondered why we act the way we do. Everything has a connection. Coming from a broken family, emotions and self-esteem run low. It connects to a broken spirit, and meanwhile in the process, a poor behavior. Watch and observe your friends and the different acquaintances you meet on a daily basis. See through their pain, their problems, and their hurts. If we want to give the world peace and a sense of freedom from bondage, it has to start with us. James 3.18 says, Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Have you guys ever felt at peace? It's a good feeling, right? But sadly, our peace sometimes is not lost long when trials and situations start confronting us. Most of the time, the biggest fault pertains to our tongues. In other words, biblically, our tongue is a little member that boasts great things. See how a great forest a little fire kindles? And the tongue is fire, a word of iniquity. It defiles the whole body. And it sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. But no man can tame their tongue. It is evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the same similitude of God. The thought of my words and the way I speak can be so deadly and full of poison, it's terrifying. Words are so powerful that it eventually destroys us and destroys others. Did you all know that holding on to a grudge or even a memory of a person talking bad about us can develop into cancer? Mind, Character, and Personality, Personality, Volume 1, Chapter 7, indicates that 9 out of 10 diseases originate in the mind. For years, it eats us inside, it bothers us. We can't rest, we do not have peace. We are holding on so tight, it eventually becomes harder to let go. There are studies of how the brain reacts to words. The book, Words Can Change Your Brain, quotes the following. A single word has the power to influence the expression of genes that regulate physical and emotional stress. A single negative word can increase the activity in your amygdala, the fear center of the brain. 
This releases dozens of stress-producing hormones and neurotransmitters, which in turn interrupts our brain's functioning. This is especially with regard to logic, reason, and language. Angry words send an alarm message to the brain, and they partially shut down the logic and reasoning centers located in the frontal lobes. This year was one of the hardest I've ever experienced. My temper was put to the test. I was in state of rebellion towards my parents, people, who held important positions in directing and guiding the youth. The problem is that every time they called my attention, I thought I was right, and they were badly mistaken. And technically I was. It's just, it's just that I defended myself with a bad attitude. I started treating them differently. I was to the point that I didn't care how they felt. I was turning from the kind, compassionate person that I was to an inconsiderate and angry person. I didn't notice that these things were emotionally draining me. And by experience, let me just tell you this. Don't ever argue with an elderly person or someone in a higher position. Chances are you will lose most likely, even if you're right. <laughs> Which was a hard lesson for me to learn. I started losing friends, respect, and love that others had towards me. Sometimes you even break relationships, and most likely those friends don't want to be around you either. Just to make a point that our thoughts, words, and actions have a drastic effect in everything that we do. I had no internal freedom. I was fighting with myself, with God, with people. It didn't matter how hard I tried. I went back to the same place. Until the day came where I sat down and I opened my Bible. God gave me the solution a long time ago. I was probably ignoring him and taking matters into my own hands. This was his counsel. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of righteous truth of freedom avails much, James 5, 16. This is the answer. When we have submitted to God with humbled hearts, he will give us true healing and freedom. Freedom in Christ. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Desire of Ages, page 25, paragraph 2 says, Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins, that we might be, oh, in which he had no share, that we may be justified by his righteousness, in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes we are healed. We carry many burdens when we don't have to carry any at all. Jesus shocked the Pharisees, the spiritual leaders of his day, when he stated, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. John 8:34. Jesus was asserting that we're all under the power and control of natural tendency to sin. We can't get away from it by ourselves. Sin brings a penalty that by ourselves we can't escape either. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. How do we find freedom from the penalty and power of sin? That comes through accepting Jesus Christ's death on that cross as a payment for our sin. As we submit to Christ, sin loses its power. Christ's power takes over. As we choose to trust and follow him, our sinful habits, thoughts, and attitudes lose their control. Guilt disappears, and peace of mind dominates. Right habits become the norm. That's freedom true freedom. Through the ages, God's church has been persecuted for the word of God. The leaders of the churches were set on traditions of the church so much so, it was merely to their own benefits. The people in the dark ages, or even in today's world, live in a battle of darkness and of no peace. Yet we see how a simpler phrase from the Bible can transform someone's life in a moment. Martin Luther, one of the reformers, spoke these words before the Diet. A diet is a court full of judges or a parliament. When he was being summoned to retract from his writings in the word of God, I cannot submit my faith neither to the Pope or to the councils because it is clear as day that they have frequently erred and contradicted each other. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scripture or by the clearest reasoning, unless I am persuaded by the means of the passages I have quoted, and unless they thus render my conscious bound by the word of God, I cannot and will not retract. For it is unsafe for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I stand. 
I can do no other. May God help me. Amen. To another appeal, he said, I consent, we announce my safe conduct. I place my person and my life in the emperor's hands, but the word of God, never. Every time I read this, I get blown away. How many of us are willing to defend the word of God? We get questions that question our faith and we do not know even how to answer them. It was not until this summer when I started canvassing that I noticed the seriousness of being a Christian. I would find myself confronted with strangers who from another religious sect standing for their beliefs, using the word of God as to why a certain principle should be that way. Most of the time, it would just be a partial truth from the Bible mixed with man-made beliefs. Sometimes I would get the door slammed in my face because I wouldn't remember or I wouldn't know how to answer them, or because my answer wasn't confident enough to give them a good reason. I lost many opportunities, but God used this experience to rebuke me. My point is, we already have the truth that sets us free imparted to us, but sadly, we do not pay enough attention. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. These courageous men in the past who stood up for Jesus, even if it meant their life, getting tortured, casting them away to prison, and they did not even have all the light we have now. Through persecution, they maintained their peace with God, and they felt free mentally and spiritually because they believed the word of God no matter what. Christ, our example of freedom. Jesus set the best example of true freedom on earth. Although we all have a part of our lives where it got really messy, and we are slowly piecing ourselves back together. His thoughts led to his attitudes. His attitudes led to his words. His words led to his actions, and his actions led to habits. Habits lead to the formation of character. Jesus watched his character because he knew that character determines one's destiny. True freedom is like a house we built, brick by brick from the choices that we make every hour of every day. Listen to the desire of ages as it describes the life of Jesus as a child in cooperation with his early earthly parents and with his heavenly father. Break by break of truth was laid into his character. It states that as a child, Jesus manifested a peculiar loveliness in this position. His willing hands were ever so ready to serve others. He manifested a patience that nothing could disturb and a truthfulness that would never sacrifice integrity. In principle, firm as a rock, his life revealed the grace of unselfish courtesy. His early years were given to the study of the word of God. From here, he would study the nature, the life of plants and animals. He only had one purpose. He lived to bless others. In other words, to set the captive free. I just wonder how many of us here live to bless others, especially in our so-called Christian lives. Our natural reaction really is to think of ourselves. For small kids, it might be even harder because they tend to think mainly of themselves. I want toys, I want food right now. No, I don't want to do this. Why can't you do it? Jesus was a small kid and he was already thinking of how should he serve or bless others. Desire of Ages goes on to say, while he was a child, he thought and spoke like a child, but no trace of sin marred the image of God in him. Most of us picture Jesus as a perfect being that never had much difficulty. Yes, he was perfect, but he was tempted in all points like we are. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. He was familiar with poverty, self-denial, privation, and privation. Christ was the only sinless one who dwelt on earth. He lived among the most wicked inhabitants of Nazareth. This shows that spiritual freedom or the ability to live a blameless life does not depend on where you live or how much wealth you have. The very ingredients needed to the, for the development of purity and firmness is in the discipline of temptation, poverty, and adversity. Jesus brought freedom to the world in and through his example of life, quiet and simple study of scriptures. If parents want their children to be free, the more quiet and simple their early life, the more they would be able to be like Jesus. Jesus is the truth, and the Bible says the truth shall set you free. Forgiveness is one of the greatest demonstrations of how Christ in the heart produces true freedom. 
I would like to end with a story that proves this principle. It is found in the book, A Heart Full of Grace, and it relates to the story of a man who was going through a very difficult time and how the power of grace in his heart bore the fruit to forgiveness that had set him free. In this book, William G. Johnson writes, some time ago, I sat in my office and I listened in amazement to the man who was busy, visiting Pastor Amen Rugelyange, president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Rwanda, was quietly recounting events in his country during the genocide of 1994, when 800,000 people were butchered, or butchered during 100 days of mayhem. Among them were Pastor Rugelyange's wife, three grandchildren, three children, and nine grandchildren. The story, as gruesome as it was, wasn't the item that held me spellbound. This humble, sincere man of God spoke about forgiveness, how he had struggled to forgive the murderers of his wife and other dear ones, how the fact of God's forgiveness enabled him to extend forgiveness, how the church he leads has become a reconciliation targeting the prisoners, most of whom are murderers, in leading large numbers to the grace of Christ. And of one Christian in particular, who saw her husband slashed to death and was herself left for dead, but who survived and later extended forgiveness to the killer, taking him into her home and adopting him as her son. Joseph wept when his brothers pleaded for forgiveness, telling a phony story about their father's request. Joseph wept, he already had forgiven them. The book goes on to say how the power of forgiveness also sets free from unrighteousness. Forgiveness is like the rain. It washes away guilt and shame, making us clean again. Forgiveness is like the wind. It blows away dirt and filth. Forgiveness is like snow. It covers our hurts and our flaws, and we become whole. Forgiveness is like the ocean. It hides us in the boundless depths of love. Forgiveness is like the wings of an eagle by which we can mount up and soar above the dark clouds of despair. But forgiveness is difficult. When we grasp how great God's mercy is toward us, then any wrong suffered from someone else pales in comparison. God's forgiveness sets us free to forgive others, free to be kind to one another, free to be tender-hearted, free to forgive one another as God forgave you. Tonight we have explored three important points, freedom in the world, freedom in Christ, and Christ our example of freedom. We have discovered that freedom of the world leads to bondage. But bondage to Christ leads to true freedom. When we are bound to Christ, we are set free, and also we are able to bring others to freedom. I think it's time to let go of the things that are holding you. Christ is waiting to set you free. Give him your heart, and he will give you freedom. Let's kneel as we pray. Dear God, thank you for another day of listening to your word and what you have to say to us. Um, Lord, you know that for us youth and us adults are struggling with true freedom, Lord. Um, the world is holding us on many things that are very hard for us to let go. But God, please give us the strength and the courage to say no to temptation and to say yes to you because after we do, we have peace and freedom in our hearts. It's the only thing that can get us to heaven, Lord. Help us all be good to each other, Lord, and bless us tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.